A business owner of religion, because I wanted to talk about them, they came out of there, and, yes. and, and people say, stop gambling. And I couldn't understand it because I was living faster than anybody else, I think. I think now, looking back at it, I would probably have been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and given, um, you know, Rohypnol or what? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, Ritalin. 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 <laughs> I knew it began with R. This explains so many of my problems with my drugs. <laughs> Really does. Seriously, do you ever think how your life may have been different if some well-meaning doctor yeah. had prescribed you with Rohypnol? It's interesting. Oh, sorry, <laughs> how well-meaning would he have been? I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> It'd been more likely a Catholic priest. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> the, um, but no. <laughs> Well, of course, it is now understood to be quite a common path uh, is, to, is to have attention uh, deficit disorder or uh, uh, hyperactivity of, uh, 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 and, and so on, and then to develop or, or, or to, the, the conditions that are then called bipolar disorder. It's quite a common route, and maybe, and I do have that to some extent, and maybe, maybe this was the thing. I was so hyper and so fast. So this wonderful woman, who herself sounded as if when she spoke, like a lot of these elderly English ladies who wore sort of lavender cardigans and beads, and, and her hair in a massive bun with a sort of steel knitting needle stuck through it, um, and uh, wisps falling down. And she always spoke to my ear as if she was, um, she was breathing in when she spoke. Hello, dear. How are you? Um, dear. Now I want you to say this. Um, and uh, it was that sort of strange voice. And she would get me to say things like, um, uh, the thing would be Betty, right? We don't know who Betty was, it was never explained, but, but Betty had a bit of, um, uh, she had a bit of bitter butter, it turns out, uh, which she added to her batter, which as you can probably imagine, rendered said batter rather bitter. Um, but, but it's all right, it has a happy ending, because Betty then took a bit of better butter um, and put it in that, that very bitter batter that I spoke of earlier uh, and, 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 and ameliorated its condition. And so, um, I, <laughs> I would say Betty had a bit of bitter butter, put it in a batter, made a batter bitter, then Betty took a bit of better butter and put it in a bitter batter, made a bitter batter better. And she would say, slow down, dear. <laughs> and eventually I would learn to say Betty had a bit of bitter butter and put it in her batter and made her batter bitter. Breathe, dear. Uh, then Betty took a bit of better butter and put it in her bitter batter and made her bitter batter better. That's bitter. And, um, <laughs> And so that's kind of how I learned. You are a credit to your coach. <laughs> Did you have, do you have favourite words that you just want to go, that the very sound of them you love, you want to use every opportunity? Sometimes they're place names. I became very obsessed with a village near me in Norfolk called Snetterton. Um, and I would drive my mother crazy just by saying Snetterton. Um, Snetterton. And... and uh, you know, we'd be driving along, I'd say, oh, mummy, and she'd go, yes, I'd go, Snetterton. I'd go, oh, you know, and she'd always fall for it, and I'd just, to this day, <laughs> to this day, I sometimes on the phone go, Snetterton, and she'd go, oh, <laughs> um, You said that your facility, your dexterity with language proved a great kind of shield against bullies at school. However, counterbalancing that, I would have thought, was that about, uh, you know, seven or eight, you gave up any sort of possibility of collecting butterflies or football cards. You started to collect facts. Yes. Now, there's nothing worse oh, more than annoying. a lippy know-all. Yeah. So how did, that, how did that balance out? It didn't. Good with there was words, nothing, dull with facts. There was nothing worse than me when I was young, I suspect. It coincided with a number of things. On, um, I virtually memorised some of the sections of the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> So I was able to say the longest ever episode of hiccups without cessation was Ronald Perdue in 1957, who for 13 years, seven weeks, four days, nine hours and two minutes had sustained involuntary spasms of the epiglottis, also known as hiccuping. And by this time the room would be empty, of course. Um, Oh, and the fry car yeah. trips must uh, have been very painful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were counterbalanced. Uh, um, I've used that word rather too often this evening, but against that must be set the fact that I was also extremely disruptive. Um, again, part of this mania, this, despite the fact that I could learn so much, I was almost, almost incapable of concentration, uh, I think. It's certainly in terms of social situations, like a classroom couldn't concentrate, so I was always being sent out. I was always a nuisance, I was always lippy, I was always, you know, dis just a general disruption. 
And I just felt different. I felt that everyone felt well, everyone else was ordinary, but also everyone else was luckier. Everyone else seemed to find life a more natural, less surprising phenomenon. To me, life was a, was a constant puzzle, both as I hit adolescence, an explosion of beauty that took my breath away. So dawn and sunlight and animals and cobwebs caught in, you know, caught in the rays of the morning sun, and, um, whatever it might be, the smell of earth would just have me in, in paroxysms of delight. I mean, like a dippy, dizzy, silly romantic poet. Um, and love smote me amidships too. But also, um, I couldn't I couldn't seem to just be ordinary like other people. I didn't like the things they seemed to like. Sport, I didn't like. Ironic, I now adore sport. But at the time, I really hated it with a passion. I, I would, you know, I, I would probably run six miles away from the school in order to get away from a running session. <laughs> <laughs> That's how peculiar I was. Did it ever occur to you that? There is the connection between that and the and the naughtinesses, as you say, the hijinks, and eventually the crime yes. that you got up to, the, the yeah. credit card theft. I mean, you ended up in in prison, as you've mentioned. Mm. I find it hard to persuade people sometimes that almost everything that motivates me in life is emotional and appetitive. It is not intellectual. People think that because I speak in the way I do or because I'm interested in knowledge the way I am and because I prize logic and reason extremely highly, um, that therefore I am above or regard myself as above emotion, that my whole life has been driven by nothing but desire. And For? Uh, all kinds of things. It started, I think, with sugar. <laughs> um, I know that sounds mad. I write a whole chapter about it, my devotion to it. it I was born in the same year uh, as, as a breakfast cereal called Sugar Puffs. Um, <laughs> strange little uh, heat puffed uh, grains of wheat glazed in glucose and sugar uh, and poured into a bowl usually and to which sugar is added. Or in my case, you know how Americans in cinemas um, will have these huge buckets of mm -hmm. popcorn and they watch and they just go like that till it's empty with a slight film over their eyes as if they're slightly playing with themselves. There's something slightly peculiar <laughs> about it. I was like that with sugar puffs. I would eat the sugar puffs. We'd get through packets a week. My mother thought it was most alarming. So there was, there was sugar. It was this desire. It was a feverish desire. It was absolutely enormous. It was replaced by cigarettes and sex, as things are, as you get older. That was the same physical thing, and, and uh, they both involve huge amounts of desire, followed by huge amounts of raging self-disgust. Or is that just me? I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, um, and in my later years, which will have to be volume three, uh, I had a, the, an episode typically yawn-worthy, tedious um, uh, uh, addiction to, uh, to, to the South American uh, uh, drug. The marching powder with this. Coffee. No, no, no <laughs> cocaine, yeah. So, um, so there was that side of me, which is, and there was love, and there was pa the passion. And the, the intellectual side of me was always the servant, and still is the servant of that. Everything, and it is of all humans, because we are first animals. We are first, you know, that is the bigger part of us. It's not that the reason is less important. The reason mediates and often loses a battle between desire. Um, and as T.S. Eliot said, between desire and performance, you know, that falls the shadow. And, and it's that shadow that has dogged me and it's also the, the wonderful subtle penumbra in which we all mostly live. It's that exciting place where we try to balance, to fight off Bones and Spock, <laughs> we return to. Um, and so, yeah, for me, appetite is, is in, in infinitely more the driver of everything I've done. But was that time that you stole and the credit card theft and uh, fraud, was that about desire for what you could get or was it just because you felt so different? I think it might have been because I felt different. I, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, we're talking about the very early 70s, 1970, 71 here. Um, th th there was no internet, well, there was an internet, it was, it, it was made of wood and ivory. Um, and, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and th you know, there were no email addresses there, and I, had known instinctively but not necessarily by giving it a name that I was what we would now call gay. Um, I, I like to say as a, as a ho-ho joke that I knew very early on that in fact the moment I was born I looked up and said that's the last time I'm going up one of those. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's obviously not literally true. Um, but oddly enough um, when I did